should Hallelujah Surely my God is the strength of my soul Your love defends me Your love defends me And when I feel like I'm all alone Your love defends me your love defends me surely my god is the strength of my soul your love defends me your love defends me and when i feel like i'm all alone your love defends me your love defends me we sing hallelujah, you're my portion, my salvation, hallelujah, you're my portion, my salvation, my salvation let's pray <clears throat> father thank you for the opportunity to come into your house your holy house because lord we are a people in need of your touch your reconciliation your love and your mercy Lord today as you walk among us Lord talk to us in a way that gives us the opportunity to show how much we care for you because Lord you first loved us and Lord this is a time that we can come asking Lord that you renew us Bring us back to that relationship with you that you want us to be, that brings glory to you, that brings peace and comfort to our lives, Lord. Lord, bless everything that goes on today, and may it bring honor and glory to you through our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, take these offerings. May it further your kingdom. May it win at least one soul back to you. Lord, we're not limiting it to just one. However many it can touch, Lord, bear fruit for your kingdom. Lord, we praise you and thank you for this time of worship. And it's in Jesus' name, to the Father, we pray. Amen.
maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can see it, you're working. Stop working, never stop, never stop working. Play making, miracle working, promise keeping, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle working, promise keeping, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 All right, that brings us to my favorite part of all of this, right? This is the real group participation. <laughs> Y'all don't sound too excited all at once. It's okay. I'm going to sing anyway. All right, we ready, guys? Keep it, keep it up. All right. Y'all got to sing. We're staying out of the mics. In the morning,
You know, we went a long time without doing those hymns, and I sure did miss them. I love doing that. There is a power in standing up here and hearing, what, we got 120, 150 people all shouting a testimony at one time. You know, don't get me wrong, I love the contemporary, I love the band, I love, but there is something about hearing God's people shout His praises that is just powerful. If you will, bow with me. We'll have a prayer before we go into the Word. Lord God, thank you again. Uh, Lord, just for allowing us to be here. God, I pray that you don't let us lose our excitement now. Uh, Lord, as the music stops and, and it's time to, to open our Bibles, Lord, and learn about you, Lord, I pray that, that the excitement would continue, Lord. Don't let us, don't let us sit down and, and lose our zeal, Lord, but, but make us hungry. Make us hungry for the words that, that are about to be fed to us, God. Let us consume them. And let us, let us just take them within, Lord, and then carry them out there into the world. God, I know that the world can be a dark place, but you've given us a light to shine. So, God, I pray that, that this would be a time for us to fuel up, to arm ourselves, Lord, and then to walk out into that world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if we'll bring the lights up a little bit. We, uh, as you know, uh, Patrick took off and went on this big, huge fishing trip in Canada. And uh, I'm mad at him. But nonetheless, he has sent a good friend uh, who I met very, very briefly this morning. But Brother Chris is going to come and bring our word. And so uh, y'all just make him welcome. And uh, let's see what God's laid on his heart today. Well, good morning. Um, I am so happy to be here. Right now, I'm a little freaking out because my iPad has uh, dropped the connection to the Wi-Fi, and so my message that's here uh, is not here. Um, but uh, it'll come up, and the Lord will, d- will do what he's supposed to do. Amen? Uh, I, again, am so thankful to be here. My name is Chris Wiley. Uh, man, what powerful worship. Thank you guys for that. Uh, I, I just... I couldn't imagine being here, honestly. Uh, Patrick and I had, had talked a little bit. Y'all call him Pastor Nix? That's what I've always known him as. Um, Pastor Nix and I g- communicated a little bit, and, and then all of a sudden he's like, hey, uh, do you want to come preach for me? <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. And, uh, and he said, I'm going on a, a fishing trip, and I too got a little jealous about that. Uh, and, and I was like, yeah, go, go for it, and I'll, I'll be glad to be here. So I'm here. A little bit about myself. Uh, and my family and kind of my relationship with, with Pastor Nix. Uh, we, we taught together uh, for a while at a school that shall be unnamed, uh, and, we, and we both left that school, uh, so enough said about that. Uh, but I have been in the ministry now for 22 years. Part of my lovely family is here with me, so if my family would stand up because I love them. Go ahead and stand up. Um, so that's my wife, Sonia, uh, Alyssa, Isabella, uh, that's two of my six kids. Uh, I have a uh, son and daughter in love, uh, and then I have another daughter who lives in Indiana, and then I have another daughter that's in heaven, and she could not be here today. Uh, and, uh, and then I have uh, a friend of my daughter's uh, that's here with us because she got to spend the night. So if you would, go ahead and open up your Bibles, and if you'll throw the scripture up there, because I still have nothing on, on my iPad. Um, so we are... In John, you know what? I'm going to pull up. I can't even pull that up. It is so frustrating. Will you grab my, yeah. yeah, if you'll just take it back there and see if it'll work. And while he's doing that, uh, I know he just prayed, but I always like to pray uh, before I get started. So uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, enter the room. We welcome you in this place. You do what you're going to do. I am just a vessel for that. Uh, And I praise you and I thank you for the gifts and the talents that you've given me to be able to do so. All glory, Father, goes back to you. Uh, You do what you want done. You say what you want said. uh, And that's the end of the story. Father, your voice, your word reaches places that my voice and my words cannot. So move in this place this morning. Thank you for everything that you do. We give you all the praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It, oh, thank you. Man, I was getting real nervous because I, I don't mind winging it, and I'll get up here and I'll probably wing some of it, but man, I don't want to wing it all. 
Pastor said I only had two and a half hours to preach, so I was like, I got to make sure I fit it all in. Um, so we're in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, and I'm going to start in verse 13. Uh, again, just, just know there's two things about my preaching. I'm loud, I'm fast, and I move a lot. So you'll just have to stay with me. I'm so thankful that I don't have to have a handheld mic because that means both my hands are now free, whereas typically I only have one. So Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 32. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and they had talked and discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast, and one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he is a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us, and they went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find the body, and they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who had said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And he said to them, how foolish are you? How slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things, then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in these scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on his way as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. And so when he went, into, when, when he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while, we talked, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? You know, when you read the Bible, you can't just read the Bible. You have to read the Bible. Amen. If you just read the Bible, you're going to miss a whole lot of stuff. So you can't just read the Bible. You have to read the Bible. God does some amazing things when he, when he talks through us in his scripture. You know, that the coolest thing about the Bible is it's full of people. People that mess things up. People that have problems. People that have issues. And that's an amazing thing for us. And it's also a very troublesome thing for us. Right? Because we look at it and we go, well, at least I'm not like that. And God goes, yeah, but you still did this. And so I, but I can still use you because if I can use them and they did that and you just did this, then we're, you can still be used. So, it, so it's a good thing. And, and that's really the Old Testament all the way. It's full of God giving promises followed by problems that people have to get through. Promises and problems. Problems. And promises. That's the entirety of the Old Testament. Look at what God does in the Old Testament. He starts talking to us about mountains made low and crooked paths made straight. He tells us that, that there's a man coming and he's going to make all things right. That, that God is going to send his son and send the Messiah and everything's going to be redeemed back to God. And, and we look at that and we go, yes, yes, yes. And then he comes and he tells Abraham, Abraham, leave your country, comma, leave your kin, comma, and I'll make you a great nation. Hear that? Leave, leave, promise. But in those two commas of him leaving and leaving is a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of years that happen between leave your kin, leave your country, and I'll make you a great nation. There's deceit in there. There's doubt, right? Right? there's conniving, there's lying, all in just those two little commas. And if you just read right past that, you miss the whole thing. 
As a matter of fact, when you read the Bible, it's not always about what God says. It's also about what he doesn't tell you. There's a lot in what God doesn't say when you read it. It would be nice if we got the promise and the fulfillment together. Wouldn't it? If God just said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation, and Abraham goes here, and he's a great nation, that would be amazing. And that's really the kind of God that we want, right? I mean, y'all know the Old Testament ends with Malachi, right? And in Malachi chapter 3, the Lord says, suddenly he will come to his temple. And then in Malachi 4, behold, the day is coming. And then guess what? 400 years pass, and there's nothing from God. God's definition of suddenly and my definition of suddenly are two totally different things. Right? But that's the way God works. That's the way he, his timing is so different than ours. Y'all know that Christ has been coming quickly for over 2,000 years. That's not quickly, Lord. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That like, Lord, I, I get what you're trying to do, but man, 2,000 years, that's a long time to wait for quickly. If you would have said, Jesus will come back at some point, okay. But you said quickly, right? You said suddenly. Promises and problems. Problems and promises. And those two commas in Abraham's life are 25 years. Hello? 25 years of waiting after he left to become the great nation. And in all honesty, if we're truly going to be honest, Abraham doesn't even see the fulfillment of that. Right? So he waits 25 years and still doesn't necessarily see the whole thing come, to, come out. He has to wait a long time after that. But this is, again, that's the problem with us reading about people. Because if you just read the Bible, it's two chapters and you go, oh, two chapters. Anybody can wait on God for two chapters, but two chapters could be 45, 75, 80 years. But we won't promise and fulfillment, right? Promise, fulfillment. That's not how God works. This is God. Promise. Fulfillment. Right? I mean, it, like, like let's, not, let's not shake this thing up and make it something that it's not. That's the problem with the church that we've been telling people, if you come to Christ, it'll all work out and it'll all be perfect. It may all work out and be perfect, but it ain't going to all work out and be perfect right now. But that's what we want. Promise. As a matter of fact, if, like, I don't even want God to get through making the promise before the fulfillment comes. We want fulfillment. Right? Before God's even finished the promise, I better see it, Lord. But God doesn't work like that. He doesn't work like that in our lives, and he didn't work like that in Scripture. It just, he just doesn't. Look, at, I mean, you take Abraham. Leave, leave, leave. I'll make you a great nation. Leave. 25 years, 30 years, 40 years. Abraham still doesn't see it. Abraham dies not seeing it. But if we think, because of what we've been taught, that if God says a promise, it's going to happen right now, we're not living in the reality of who God is. And how many of you know that's more important? To actually live in the reality. God spoke to Israel. He told them that the Messiah is coming. And again, 400 years, nothing. Could you imagine being a grandfather, a great-grandfather? talking to your great-grandkid about that? Grandpa, why do we do this? Because God promised a Messiah. Well, when's the Messiah coming? I don't know. It's been 399 years. I don't know. When was the promise written? Long time ago. But we got to keep moving forward. We got to quit progressing, keep progressing towards the promise. Because if God said it, it's going to happen. The when is irrelevant. 
right? As a matter of fact, if you try to get that from God, anybody ever got a promise from God and you're like, God, when is that going to happen? Hello? Hey, I'm a talker backer. So if I say something, talk back to me, right? If, if, you, if you hear from God, God will give you most often, he'll give you the what? I'll make you a great nation. But he never, ever really gives you the win that's going to happen. You might get the win, right? And then you can ask God, well, where am I going to see that? You might get the where. But you got to get through the what, the when, and the where, and you may not get the why until after it's over. Hello? God, why am I going through this? Anybody ever ask that question? Why is this happening to me? Why am I the one? You'll find out when it's over. <laughs> but God, I, like, I need the why. If you can tell me the why now, it'll make it easier to go through. I don't want to make it easier for you to go through. I want you to rely on me to get you through. Hello? And so that's what God does. And that's what he's done all throughout history. These guys are walking back. Jesus has been crucified. Jesus is dead. He's in a tomb. We get the benefit of being able to read backwards. They didn't have that. So they're walking back from Jerusalem, having seen their Messiah, whom they thought they just told you was going to be the Redeemer of Israel. And they're walking back home. I can assure you they are not walking home, skipping and jumping. Because most of these disciples that followed Jesus gave up everything. Most of these disciples told their family, I don't care what you say, I don't care what you're doing, I'm going to follow this man because he is the Messiah. Most of these disciples walking back home looked like fools. Because the man that you said was the Messiah is now dead. So I can imagine on this road back home, I've got to go face all my family, all my friends who told me not to go in the first place because 20 years ago we had another guy claiming to be the Messiah and he wasn't it either. Rome killed him also. 10 years before that, there was another guy and guess what? Rome killed him. Yeah, but this guy's different. This is the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one before that said he was different too. And now all of a sudden, I've got to go back home, face all those friends, all that family who told me I was a fool for leaving and going to follow him with my head down because they're right. Or so I think. Because the Messiah is dead. And then <laughs> they're talking about these things and they're probably talking about what are you going to say? Who are you? How are you going to talk to your family? What excuse do you got? What are you going to talk about? And then, y'all, Jesus is so cool to me. We, like, we portray Jesus as this, he walks around like on clouds and he's, you know, I don't know if he's got angel wings in your vision, but like, I just see him like, this is the way we portray Jesus. I shall not deal with the commoners. And that ain't Jesus. Jesus gets in the dirt with you. Right? They're walking back full of doubt, full of discontentment, full of disgrace, and Jesus just pops up. Hey, how y'all doing? Right? Because he's real. Hey, how y'all doing? All right. Calm down, dude. And Jesus is like, what are y'all talking about? Now, again, when I read the Bible, I put it through the filter of the Chris Wiley translation. So, when Jesus says, what are y'all talking about? You, when they say it, they're like, are you the only one who has not been in Are you the only one that lives in Iraq? What they're saying is, are you the only stupid person around here? <laughs> Have you been living under a rock that you don't know that Jesus just died three days ago and now we can't find him? What is the matter with you, dude? Right? Because they're people. Anybody here, would that have been your response? Dude, get away from me. Who are you? What are you talking about? How do you not know what's going on? Right? And Jesus doesn't back off from that. Jesus doesn't go, oh, I'm so sorry to bother you. No. Jesus comes right back in the face. Oh, you're a doubter. How foolish are you that you don't believe? Jesus does not hold any punches, y'all. I, I love Jesus because he will just get right in your face and tell you exactly what it is. Forgive me if this offends you. I don't mean to. 
But to me, Jesus is quite gangster. Right? Because he does not hold back anything from you. He's going to cut right to the heart of the matter. And so he gets in there, and they're full of all of this discontent, all of this doubt, all of this being upset. And here's Jesus. Why don't you just believe? What's the problem? You've heard the Messiah, you've heard the prophets, and you still don't get it? What's wrong with you? And then he goes, let me go back to Moses and preach everything. (laughs) Jesus is going to walk with them for seven miles. Anybody ever walk for seven miles? That's That's a long walk. I don't walk for seven miles. Seven mi- they walked seven miles and it took a day. Seven miles for me is going to take a month. Because I don't walk. I don't want to do that. Right? And then to come to find out, here's Jesus walking with them and Jesus is explaining everything from Moses until Jesus for seven miles. And guess what the Bible says? They still don't get it. They still don't understand. I'm a very simple guy, right? So when Jesus walks onto the path, shouldn't this have given you a clue as to who he was? Right? Like, if I had spent three years with Jesus and then he walks in, I'd be like, Jesus, because I know what he looks like. That's the problem with the church. Some of us don't know what what he looks like. Woo, I could go there, couldn't I? Right? But if this right here didn't give you a clue to who he was, shouldn't him talking the scriptures to you tell you who he was? I mean, they even later said that our hearts burned within us, right? But that didn't even catch on. Jesus explaining all of scripture from Moses until himself doesn't click in their brains that this is Jesus. Why? Because I already told you, they're downcast. They're hurting. So you better be careful labeling people when they're in the middle of their hurts. Because when you're hurting, you can't see Jesus properly. Right? I mean, look, it's full of people in Scripture that did that. Again, when we start asking God questions, it shows that that we're not looking at Him correctly. Because we're supposed to trust that all things work out to our good for those that are called according to his purpose and love him, right? So if that's true, why are you questioning it? You're hurting. And God's big enough to handle those questions. He clearly was right here. And so all of this is going on, and they still do not know that this is Jesus. They still don't know. And then they get to the house, again, Gangster move on Jesus. He's going, all right, peace out. (laughs) Right? Because it said the Bible says he looked like he was just going to keep on walking. All right, y'all have a good one. I'm out. And they begged him to stay. Right? Why? Because Jesus wants to be invited in. But once he's invited in, things change. Hello? Hello? So they invite Jesus in. Jesus goes, okay, I'll stay. And then the Bible says that this thing that he did that I love, it says that they didn't recognize him until he broke the bread. I want to read it again if we'll look at it because it kind of stirred something in me, right? It's verse 30. It says, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. That, that just hit me all of a sudden. It's like, Lord, what, what are you saying with that? And it reminded me of a story that you all know when Jesus feeds the 5,000. It's found in Matthew 14, 19. And I want to see if you'll, if you'll catch this. Matthew 14, 19 says, Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down in the grass. And he took the five loaves, or he took the bread and the fish, And looking up to heaven, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. Y'all starting to see a pattern? 
What about this one? And, and another time in Matthew chapter 15, verse 36, Jesus is feeding the 4,000 here, and it says, And he took the seven loaves and the fish, and he gave thanks, or he blessed it, and he broke them, and he gave them to the disciples. Anybody seeing that? And then in Mark chapter 14, when Jesus is having his very last meal with his disciples before his execution and his crucifixion, look at what he says. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, broke the bread, and blessed it, and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. So Jesus has a pattern of dealing with things. He takes things, he breaks them, he blesses them, and then he gives them away. Hello? He takes things, he breaks things, he blesses them, and then he gives them away. Everybody say it with me. He took the bread, he broke the bread, he blessed the bread, and he gave the bread. He took it, he broke it, he blessed it, and then he gave it. One more time. He took it, he broke it, he blessed it, and then he gave it. If Jesus had a pattern of doing that with loaves and with fish, what do you think the pattern is for your life? Well, let's look at Abraham. Abraham, leave. So what is he doing? He's taking. Right? And he says, I'll make you a great nation, but before I do that, before that blessing comes you're going to have to sacrifice your son, so I'm going to break you. And then he blesses, and what's the purpose of the blessing besides blessing the Father is to bless the nations. Isn't that what he says? I'll take you and I'll make you a great into the nations. So he takes Abraham, he breaks Abraham, then he blesses Abraham, and then he gives Abraham. Look at Moses. Moses, get out of Egypt. So he took him. Burning bush, I'm going to break you. Hello? Bless you, I'm going to make you a leader. And then give you, I'm going to give you to Israel. And you watch the whole process of Moses' life. He's taking Moses and separating him, and he's breaking him, and he's blessing him, and he's giving him back to Israel. What about the disciples in the New Testament? Hey, come follow me. So what is he doing? He's taking them. And then he breaks them. Peter? Anybody see in that moment of life where Peter gets broken? Get behind me, Satan. Right? Hello, that'd break me. And then he blesses them. And then he gives them to the rest of the world. So he took them. He broke them. He blessed them. And he gave them. He took them. He broke them, he blessed them, and he gave them. The problem that I have with this, Father, is I don't like the breaking part. I don't like being broken because being broken hurts. Being broken reveals shame in my life. Being broken reveals that I don't have it all together like I try to perpetrate when I come into this place in front of everybody else. So I don't want to be broken. And I don't know really of anybody in their life that truly does. It would be awesome to experience God mountaintop, 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 mountaintop all the time, never go down. But we don't learn a lot from God on the mountaintops. Hello? We just don't. We don't get to understand who God really is on all those mountaintops experiences. When we get to truly know who God is, is in the valleys. When we're broken. When we're broken. See, we sing all the cute songs when we come into the worship, and hey, I'm a worship guy. As some of you probably heard me, uh, my, my voice is loud. I love to worship. I think worship is awesome. I think, honestly, it should be mandatory. 
Because if you can't worship down here, you ain't going to worship up there, and we may not see you up there. Hey, this may be my one and, one and done time here, so I'm just going to step on all the toes and say it as it is, right? Like, I'm, I'm just going to do it. If you can't worship God because of what he's done in your life here, you may not make it up there to actually worship him. Because if you don't understand where he brought you from, and who he brought you from, and who he brought you to, and what he's making you into, you don't have a reason to worship. Therein lies the breaking. This is why the breaking must happen. This is why it's got to go through this. You can you will cut yourself short if all you do is look at the good songs that we sing about God. I promise you, you will. Look at Philippians 3.10. This is Paul talking. Philippians 3.10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Man, that'd be great if that verse stopped right there. Right? Anybody ever wish that you had a whiteout, you could white out some words in the Bible? Is that just me? Like, I understand the Bible's holy, but sometimes I'm like, God, if you hadn't wrote that, it would have been amazing. But God knows better than me. He's holier than me. And so he understands that if I don't get past just the resurrection and do the next part of this, and the fellowship of his sufferings, that I will not be complete in him. He says, if you that you may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. That's Philippians 3.10. Being conformed to his death. Then 2 Corinthians says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. 1 Peter 4.13 But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Rejoice in it. Rejoice that you get to partake. Rejoice that people make fun of you. Rejoice that people leave you because of your stance for Him. Rejoice that things get cut out of your life and get cut out of your life and you can't do all the things that all the earth gets to do because you're with Him. Rejoice. But we don't. I sure missing out. Lord, it sure be fun if I could just go hang out with them. They were, it was fun when we, you know, used to hang out together before I came to know you. I'm not saying I want to do the same stuff that they're doing, Lord. I just want to go hang out with I miss my friends. Paul says you better get it right. I understand missing friends, but you better turn to Christ. You better miss him more. You better desire him more. And that's why we have to go through the breaking. We teach things like, if you have more faith, you won't have to go through that. Anybody ever heard that in church? Well, if your faith was just in the right place, you wouldn't experience that. It may be because my faith is in exactly where God wants it to be, which is why I'm facing exactly what I'm facing. Because God is trying to take me from where I was to where he wants me to be. Amen? And if God wants to take me over there, then I better be willing to walk over there to get what he wants. Because he knows best. But again, that's the breaking. Right? That's the breaking. I don't want to go through the... We, we sit up here in church and we pray, Lord, if you'll just get me out of this. Lord, if you'll just not let this happen to me. If this won't be the case for my life. What we should be praying is, Lord, if you'll just get me through this. Don't get me out of it. Do y'all understand that when you look at the Bible, every battle that was fought was only leading up to the next battle? Amen? David fought a bear just so he could go fight a lion, just so he could go fight Goliath. If David had not been through the bear and the lion, he would have never been ready for Goliath. But what we do is, Lord, don't let me face the bear. Well, God said it, but if you don't face the bear, you won't be ready for Goliath that's coming. 
So, Lord, let me face the bear, the lion, oh, my. <laughs> Whatever I got to face to get ready for whoever's coming. Right? The children of Israel. You're, I'm going to take you to a promised land. The land's going to be flowing with milk and honey. Ooh, that sounds so good. I don't know why there's a river of milk and honey. For me, if you ask me, it's because they had gigantic Oreos. That's the only reason you need a river of milk and honey. To dunk that Oreo in the milk. Right? But here we go, land flowing, milk and honey, promise. What's the problem? It's full of people that are your enemies. God says, I'll go with you in every step and every place your foot treads will be yours. But what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to fight the battle. Some of us would have never crossed over. Why? Because I don't want to go through the breaking. I don't want to go through the breaking process. I don't want to go through the battle. Lord, you said you would fight my battles for me, so go fight. I'll sit here and wait. And that's what we teach. Those that wait upon the Lord. What are you doing, brother? Oh, I'm just waiting on the Lord. That's not what that means. What that means is that you wait on the Lord. Like when you go to a restaurant, who comes to your table? The waiter. And what does the waiter do who is waiting on you? They serve. Well, I don't know where to serve. It don't matter. That waiter don't know what you're going to order. That waiter don't know how, what, what drink you're going to take. They don't know how, how many uh, full glasses of sweet tea you're going to need. They just know I'm serving. And if they come to my table, it's going to be a lot of sweet tea. But that's what that word means, those that wait upon the Lord. Because as long as I'm moving forward with him and I'm serving him, my strength is constantly renewed. And that's the breaking. So God takes you and then he breaks you and he blesses you and then he gives you. And it's amazing when you're in, in, in the breaking part. Because guess what's next? The blessing. Right? Right? Man, if you're sitting right here this morning and you're in the breaking part of your life, because blessing's next. But if I'm in the taking part, breaking's next. But you know what? That's all good. Because right after that breaking is going to come the next blessing. And then he's going to take you in that blessing and he's going to give you and he's going to say, hey, you need to go to somebody else and you need to give away what I just gave you. But Lord, that's mine. No, it's not. It's mine. I'm just letting you use it. Right? And so just like a typewriter, I know I'm dating myself. Y'all know what a typewriter is, right? <laughs> You're sitting there and you typing and then you get to the end of the page. Ding! Ding! Guess what God does? Takes you. He breaks you. He blesses you, and he gives you, ding! And then he takes you, and he breaks you, and he blesses you, and he gives you, ding! And he's right back. And it's just a constant process in your life, and that's how God works for you. So no matter where you are in the circle, you're still in the circle. And it works all to your good. Worship team, if y'all can come on back. It works to your good. He takes you and he breaks you and he blesses you and then he gives you. And I thought, is that, is that process anywhere else in the Bible? The Lord said, yeah. <laughs> if we go back to the very first illustration, it says that he took the bread so then God said, what about bread? I said, what about bread, Lord? You know, what about bread? So what does he do with bread? He takes the wheat. What happens with the wheat? They got to break it. Yeah, they thresh it. And in that breaking process, the, if you don't know what the, the breaking or the threshing process is, they take the wheat and they take it into this open area. And they take the stalks and they beat them against the ground. The reason it has to be an open area is because they need the wind to come through. Anybody know what the wind represents in the Bible? His Holy Spirit. 
right? So he, they take the grain and they break it, and the breath of God comes through. And what they're breaking is they're breaking the, the, the valuable part from the invaluable or the unusable. And in that breaking process, all the things that God doesn't want from your life, He uses the Holy Spirit to break it off of you. So that He can get to the meat of the matter, He can get to the kernel, He can get to what's needed. Right? And then they take that kernel, that grain, and they ground it, breaking again. Until it gets into a fine powder. And then... They can mix it, and they bless it with some different ingredients, some different people, some different things to make it what he wants it to be. And then they put it in the oven, and man, it smells so good. Anybody else love bread? Man, I love bread. This low-carb diet, and it ain't for me. I'm sorry. Clearly, it's not. But he, they, they take the bread, and they, they, they put it in the oven, and it gets to smell it. And it's just blessed. And then they put a little bit of butter on it. It's even more blessed. Hallelujah. And then they pull it out. And what's the purpose of it being baked? Of the wheat going through all of that process. What's the purpose? So that you can have it. So it's been given to you. What does God do with you? He takes you from who you thought you were, from who the world said that you were, from what circumstances tried to make you to become, what your choices led you to believe who you really were, and he takes you out of that. And he says, no, 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 that's not my plan for you. And, but, but, but before I can bless you, before I can look. Okay, Holy Spirit, I hear you. Do you know why Adam and Eve had to be kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Jesus, the, the Bible tells us. God said if they stay in the Garden of Eden, they will eat from the tree of life. Well, God, that, that seems kind of harsh. That's, that, why can't they eat from the tree of life? You want them to be here forever, right? That was your whole plan. Yes, it was. But I didn't want them to live forever in that way. They ate from the knowledge of tree of good and evil, which they were not supposed to. They sinned. If they had continued to eat from the tree of life, they would have forever lived a life of sin. You with me? They would have forever been stuck in that place. But God said, I have to break that off of them. So they've got to get out of the garden so that they can now live eternally in me, which is perfection that I created them for in the first place. So when God takes you out of your old life, out of your sin, and it seems like everything that was once good in your life is now kind of falling off. It's because God is making you into who he wants you to be and he doesn't want you to live forever like that. And so you go through the breaking. Then God can actually bless you because stuff is breaking off of your life. If he blesses you without the stuff being broken off, you're going to stay that way forever. Then he gives you and he gives you to a local church. And he says, hey, I want you to go here and I want you to participate and I want you to be a part. He gives you to a local community, to a local town, to a local job. This is why it's so important to talk to him about these things. Lord, where do you want me to work? Lord, where do you want me to go to church? Lord, where do you want me to live? So that he can put you in a place and he can give you to that community. He can give you to that church. He can give you to that job. And then he goes, all right, you've done all you can do there. Now let me take you again. I'm going to take you up to this place. And I'm going to take you to this town or this community or this church. And now I'm going to break you again. All the things that you brought from this place, you don't need them no more. Right? Which is why church hopping is not a good thing. Because some of us hop out before God tells us to hop out. And we hop out and we bring all the same old stuff with us. And we try to make this new church like our old church. And God said, if you had just been broken where I told you to stay, you wouldn't have brought that old stuff with you. And now then you could flourish and I can, you could walk in the blessing. But now, guess what we got to do? We got to walk through the breaking. But I love God. 
And I love what he does with our lives. Everybody stand with me. Here's what I want to know. Will you be honest and say, I'm in a breaking phase right now? Who will be honest? I got a couple of hands going up. Awesome. If you're in a breaking phase, come up here right now. Come up here to the front. If you are not in a breaking phase, praise God. Right? But those of you that didn't walk up to the front, go ahead and spread out just a little bit. It's fine. Those of you that didn't walk up here because you're in a breaking phase, guess what's coming? Your time of breaking is coming. Your time of taking is coming. Your time of giving may be here. If you're in a time of giving, give. If you're in a time of being taken out, go. And if you're in a time of blessing, praise the Lord. These folks right here, breaking time is hard. So here's what they need. Y'all to be praying for them. They need y'all to be lifting them up. They need y'all to be giving to them. It doesn't mean money. It could be time. It could be a shoulder. It could be an arm. But they need you to be taking care of them. Now, everybody that's on this front, y'all in a hurting place right now. I understand that. But turn around and look at the congregation behind you. They need you. They need you. You say, I don't got anything else to give. You're right. Right now. Right now, you're right. You don't have anything else to give. You're being broken. It's fine. But right after the breaking is going to be the blessing. And at that point, you better be ready to give. Because they're going to be in the breaking. Here's what I want to do. If any of you know any of these folks up here, or you don't, it doesn't matter to me. Come and pray for them. I want y'all to come pray. Do not pray. Come on up. Do not pray that God take them out of their situation. Pray that God take them through their situation right now. Pray that God gets them through that. Pray that they will not falter in doing what is right and doing the hard thing and staying with God and trusting Him through the whole process. Heavenly Father, I just thank you. Every single person that came up here, Father, that was going through that breaking phase, that's in that part of the cycle of their life, Father, I would pray right now that they would be steadfast, that they would not waver, that, that they would believe and hold firm to the promises that have been given over their life, that no matter how big or how, how monstrous or how powerful the trouble seems, that they see those moments, they see those opportunities as opportunities to trust you, to worship you. God, only you know how long when it'll be over, and what they're going to gain out of it. But Father, we do not need those answers. What we need is you. So Holy Spirit, sweep across the room. Every single person, the hurting, the pain, the past, the sin, the addiction, the control, the relationship, whatever it might be, Holy Spirit, breathe. Break them. Break off that relationship. Break off that addiction. Break off that shame. Break off. Break it off. Break it off. Raise them up. Prepare them for the blessing. We declare your name is holy. Your name is worthy. And Father, whatever we have to go through to get to you, so be it. In Jesus' name, amen.
I don't know how y'all normally do it, but let's do a worship song. Like, I, I want y'all to be excited, right? Because, hey, breaking is about to be over, right? Blessing is upon us. Giving is upon us. So let's worship the Lord. Amen. With a melody, you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone, and I'm no longer a slave.
go back. We're not going to go out that soft. We're going to go out victorious. Bring back that first chorus. We're going to go out on a big note. Amen. We're going out. We're ready to go out there, ain't we? Let's go. Bring us that first chorus, bro. still have some praying. Bow with me. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, Lord, I just pray today that that we've all heard you, that we've all felt you, Lord, and that those of us that, that are in that breaking, God, that you would just strengthen us, Lord, and, and like he said, not, not to take us out of the Lord, but to see us through it, to grow us. Lord, those of us that are that are not in that moment right now, God, help us to look forward to it. And I know that that doesn't make sense in, a, in an earthly way, God, but, but if you're with us, then none can stand against us. And God, as long as we're in your plan, then we know we're safe and secure in you. Lord, whether we understand it, Lord, help us to, help us to accept our inability to understand what it is that you're doing, God. But Lord, just help us to trust in you, to have that faith in the highs and the lows, God, just to know that you are our Father and that we can always reach out to you and we never walk alone. As we go out into this world, Lord, I just pray you would you would help us to remember these things, that you would arm us, protect us, guide us, and bring us back. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, hold up, real, real, real quick. Uh, one, it's it's good to be back after a long week. All right, away with the, with the kids at camp. Uh, but brother, this church needed that. All right, for real. Um, I'll, I'll kind of joke just a little bit. Um, so we took your kids, twenty two of them, twenty four of them. All right. Tuesday, I was broken. Right? By, by Wednesday, I saw the blessing. And then come Saturday, we were happy to give them back. Right? Thrilled. All right. Um, but man, God sent you here. For real. That, that, that was amazing. Um, I, I plan on giving uh, the, a, a lesson here in a couple weeks to show you what happened at camp. But let's just say God's alive. He's still moving. Don't doubt that because at the beginning of the week, we started Monday. I saw maybe 40 kids out of 500 worshiping. By the end of the week, there was over 450 kids worshiping. Not like this. Not, not with their heads down. 
God's not done. All right, I just wanted to share that, that this lesson spoke to me, all week spoke to me. Um, man, don't fear the breaking. Don't fear it. Don't fear it. That's all I got. I, I hope that you have a blessed week and that we go and combat the evil that's in this world. Take this lesson. Take it with you. Love you guys.